Jenna, you can see the calls. Do you have someone yeah. in particular that you might want to go to next? Um, how about Alex from Saskatchewan? Alex from Saskatchewan wants an honest discussion. What is science and can we put it to the test regarding evolution? For some reason, the talk button didn't work just then. Now you should be on, oh. Alex. How are you? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Oh, good to be talking to you. Yeah. I'm Hi. What I wanted to do is, um, hi, Jenna. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, you know, we hear discussions about science, what of the case, and the, the question is, well, let's put science to the test. So, like I thought to myself, well, before we can go any farther, can we come up with a common definition of what science is, just quickly? You know, do you want to give me a definition of science, Jenna or Matt, and then we can go from there? Science is it originally from the Latin for knowledge. And so it is methodologies that lead us reliably to knowledge or the most accurate understanding of the world. I don't know what you mean by putting science to the test because science isn't a thing. It is a, it, it is rooted in a notion uh, of a desire to best understand the world. Science doesn't make proclamations of truth. It creates models that are the best current explanation we have given the available evidence and all of the findings of science are constantly being tested and independently verified. That's where the process of falsifiability works in and peer review. So I don't know what you mean by putting science to the test when that's all that science well, is, is constantly putting data to the test. Maybe can we put the scientific okay. method to the test? Is that what you mean? Oh, well, basically what I was asking is, you know, if we could come up with a common definition of science and, and you've answered it well. I mean, in, in other words, the, I think we could say that it's, you know, experimental, it's demonstrable, it's reliable, it's repeatable. In other words, we can show with science something to be true because we can do it over and over and over again. Wouldn't you? Not, not, not necessarily. So while repetition, repeating results is a thing that doesn't mean that you can't do scientific investigations where you can't like for example consider first of all science is all about inference it's not it's not deductive it's not lock solid it is what are the best inferences we can make from available evidence and so when you look at something like the theory of evolution by means of natural selection now evolution is just a fact it's an observed fact that there is a variety of living things and that allele frequency within genes changes over time. And so the, the model, the theory of, of evolution by means of natural selection is just an attempt to explain as best we can what the driving factors are for evolution. And it wasn't, it didn't have to be that natural selection uh, won out. It could have been that artificial selection had the most evidence for it. Um, but as we begin to explore this, we realize hey, we have no way to demonstrate that there's an artificial selector in here and we can watch things. We, we as humans can be artificial selectors, like we breed certain dogs together and change them or dogs being related to wolves. But evolution, we, we don't have a time machine. So the, the way we can uh, make testable predictions within evolution is to say, okay, all of this is based on a bunch of different di disciplines, not only biology, but geology, et cetera. And so if our understanding and our model is as accurate as we think it is, then we should be able to go to this region of earth and dig down to rock of this age and find a transitional species of this type in that rock. And that's exactly what we did when we discovered Tiktaalik. And it doesn't matter if we don't find more examples of Tiktaalik, that shows as evidence that at least our understanding is reasonably good. We we knew enough about the way the earth was in this area at this time and what biological life forms were there from other fossil data, et cetera. And we said, we should be able to find something like this in this particular rock. And we should also, by the way, not find the classic example of fossil rabbits in the Precambrian, because we know when modern rabbits, you know, it's not like you're going to find that. And so we go out and we made a testable prediction and we found Tiktaalik. Now that just ties in with countless other disciplines within evolution, where we start talking about uh, shared common ancestry. And you can look at things like chromosome two, the, the fusing of chromosome two. Can we prove that that is a fused chromosome? No, 
but it has all the, I mean, you can't prove anything in that sense, but to the extent that we can demonstrate that the human chromosome two is, is fused, all the marks are there. The telomeres, the overlapping, the slight difference that we would expect to see is all there. And it's the, it's, it's the model that makes the most sense of, we have common ancestors that are also apes. And at some point, these two chromosomes fuse, and that is what makes humans different. That's what science does. It doesn't say, oh, this is absolutely true. If someone had a model that countered evolution, that said, hey, all of what science knows about evolution by natural selection uh, is wrong, and there's actually a different answer, then they would be able to present evidence for it, have it scientifically evaluated, and it would become the new prevailing theory. That's the way science works. That's why I was confused, because science is constantly tested. But this COVID-19 is a demonstration of evolution in action. Okay, now let me let me just ask you this. So let's say since the uh, formation of the world or the beginning of the universe, which was right, I think about 13.77 billion years ago, whatever the case there, obviously were forces and processes in action, right? From that particular time. So my question, second question to you would be is this. Do you believe that the processes and the forces that were in action at the formation of the world are still the processes and actions or processes and forces that are basically at work in the world today? So for, for the, yeah, so let me, <coughs> sorry, I had to cough. We have, so when you say the beginning of the world and you say 13.77 billion years ago, that's the... Yeah, the, well, we could go too with, uh, let's say, the average age of the Earth. Let's say it's around 4.8 billion years. But the point there is, obviously, there was a start. It's produced. So those forces, if you take a look and, you know, as people give you the model or whatever the case, the, the forces that were there continued, continued, continued until around 4.8 billion years ago. And then what happens is then you have the formation of the world. So but, the question but, is, are the forces that were there and present the same forces that are there here and present and driving that process forward? So this is, this is essentially a question of, can we demonstrate the uniformity of the physical rules? And while we're still working out, you know, well, hang on, while we're still working out quantum mechanics and how that fits in there, generally speaking, the prevailing view of science is that gravity is what it is and works how it works and has since the, the formation of the universe. And once, once you have that, as a functional part of a model, in order to show that it was different, you would need to provide evidence that there, that it was different or that it changed. And w whether or not there's local changes, like at different points in the universe, uh, where where these foundational principles, the, the weak nuclear, nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, those sorts of things, if they're in fact different, you would need to show evidence for it because of the null hypothesis, which is that something isn't true until it's demonstrated or that you know, this is the way things are and have been until we have reason to think they have been some other way. Right. My, my point here is I believe that the forces that were present at the beginning of the world or whatever the case is, as the claim is, are still present and active today because if there is this steady progression or the evolution of things over a period of time, there's got to be some constant. So that constant would be the forces, you know, and so when I take a look at the world today, I think, well, what are some of the natural forces in the world? And I think to myself, well, you know, there's atmospheric, there's solar, lunar, chemical, uh, you know, you know, with the earth movement, what are the case? You have that, you have hydraulic forces of water. All of these forces are the forces that are basically operating in the world today. And if you know, the model is that things continually, you know, evolve or what the case, I would think that the, those forces would have to be present today to push this forward because... Ah, I don't know. So, so the fact that gravity, like we can just, let's just agree, you and I, uh, gravity, uh, the acceleration due to gravity is has been the same. Okay? Yes. Does that mean that things are like, like if I let go of this, container it will fall but if it's sitting there gravity's still acting on it even though it's not falling the 
Absolutely. The physical forces that we're talking about when we talk about uniformitarianism or, or the, the notion mm -hmm. that the foundational principles are there doesn't mean that things don't change. Like, for example, once upon a time, there was no planet Earth, but our best understanding of the model of how planets are formed would hold that the accretion disk uh, from the formation of the sun, eventually things start attracting each other and form planets. Now, at one point, there wasn't a planet. And there was all of these objects which formed together to essentially become a planet. That doesn't continue happening because we've used up that material to make the planet. Similarly, the fact that there's gravity and strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force doesn't mean that the state of affairs, the chemical state of affairs on Earth are always the same. And so whatever it was that caused, that, that is the explanation for the origin of life, the state of the Earth has changed since then. And whatever it was that prompted um, past evolutionary changes, the state of the earth has changed since then, but we're still evolving. It's like, not like evolution stops this, this change. Right. I don't, I don't exactly represent my parents who don't exactly represent their parents, etc. You can't look at a small chunk of time and reach the conclusion that, well, the forces are all there. Why isn't evolution still going? It is. You could, you could, if you had a time machine, you could go back to the the Jurassic era, era and e even if there was a thinking mind there that could process these sorts of thoughts, they wouldn't be looking around going, well, we all evolved to this and now we're the pinnacle and nothing is changing. So you don't, yeah. we have uniformity as far as we can tell, but that doesn't mean the same things happen over and over again once the system has changed. Okay, well, here's... The point what I'm trying to get across, and I, I seem to be getting that indication from you, is that the forces, are, there are forces in effect, maybe some of the forces are more predominant back then, maybe less now, but the point is nature has forces which work upon the earth and the substance of the earth and everything that is here, correct? Yes, it's physics yes. and chemistry. Okay. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> so we got that. What I want to basically do is just put a simple little experiment before you and, you know, basically, you know, test that hypothesis. If you've got the time, it should be pretty quick here. Would you be game for that? To test what hypothesis? The natural forces producing the things that are basically surround us here on this earth. That physics works? That physics is... Real? We observe no, this the natural time. forces, okay, the natural forces, obviously there was no other force possible, and this was natural forces of the world. These are random forces, basically controlled. No, 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 no. You've gone off on a, on a thing where you've, where you've said no other forces are possible. I don't, I don't know where you're getting that. Then you're saying random forces. Physics isn't random. It's the exact opposite of random. Acceleration take a look at of gravity is directly proportional to mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. That's not random. Chemistry, oh, and I agree with oxygen molecules and, and oxygen molecules combining to make water molecules. That's not random. I agree. Okay, so what is it you what is the hypothesis you want us to test? And how can we test well, it well, in the conversation on the show? Right. The, the, uh, the hypothesis is random for random chance versus uh, design, intelligent design. Intelligent design versus Excuse random chance, and that's all there. That's all there can possibly be. Well, let's let's put it to the test. That's not. No, no. It's not. It's not something you can put to the test. We need to define things considerably further. And it's not, for example, evolution by means of natural selection is not random. You don't get to say which makes more sense, an intelligently designed system or a random system, if neither of those are demonstrable. Well, here's the question. If I want to accomplish a certain means, okay? Yeah. And the question is... How can I get to that means? Can I demonstrate a method that would be able to deliver that which I... It doesn't matter. It a, doesn't well, matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because you would have to demonstrate that this was done with a goal in mind. Evolution doesn't have a goal. The universe doesn't have a goal. We are not the intended outcome. 
We are what happened. Mm -hmm. We are consequence. That's what I want to demonstrate with this particular little scenario or experiment. That's all I want to do. Would you like you to want to, you want to demonstrate the thing that I just said? Would that be all right with you? Why would we need to demonstrate that? This is just by definition and by our understanding. Evolution is an unguided process with no goal. In order for someone well, to make an argument that there was a goal, they would need to present evidence that there was a goal. So why would we need to spend any time going over something if you're now in agreement with me that there wasn't a goal? The point is this. There is a goal. Okay, my goal here is to... Then, let me finish, please. My goal is to demonstrate the best possible way to get to a desired end. Now, you can say yeah. evolution Stop. doesn't have Stop. an end, but obviously Stop. it has an end. Stop. I don't care. I will agree with you that an intelligent design is the best way to get to a desired end because there can't be a desired end without an intelligence to act upon it. None of that is relevant to the universe that we inhabit until you demonstrate that there was an, in fact, a goal, and then you can make an argument for why you think you've discovered the source of that goal. But there isn't any identifiable goal. You just believe there is, and that's why you think that, well, intelligent design makes more sense. Yes, it makes more sense if you start by believing there's a goal, but you don't get to start there and be rational. Well, don't you have to start believing that there's something that can have a goal? Like when you say that, that this is a desired end, desired by who? Well, let's say me and you. Why, why are you assuming that I'm desiring the world to be like it is today? Now, let me just run the experiment before you or just this. Oh, but I just don't understand. You. You're saying that there, there's a desired end. Who's desiring the end? Well, all I want to do is I want to demonstrate a principle here. I don't know why you don't answer my question. I, yeah, I don't know why you can't. Go ahead, ask it again then. Go ahead. When you say that there, this is a desired end, who is desiring the end? Who is, it, who is the agent that is doing the desiring? Well, in this particular experiment, I have a desired end, and I want to demonstrate that. So you You're want to demonstrate want to that, that this world is what you determined and desired? No, I'm just saying with regards to this world. I've already conceded, Alex, that if there is a desired end, then intelligence is likely to be the best path to that desired end. I already conceded it. Why would we need to do an experiment to do to get to a point that I already conceded? Well, my question is then, if you have uh, an intelligent design, you have a purpose, you want to get to a particular end, then you take particular action to get to that end. But on the other hand, if you're relying on the natural forces of the world to reduce that end for you, the question is, will you be able to get to that desired end? Well, First of all, did we? You, you just smuggled in. See, I conceded that if there is a desired goal, that intelligent yes. action towards that goal may well be the most efficient pathway to that goal. I already conceded that. But what you right. just asked was, is that if there is this desired goal, are you likely to get right. there if you just rely on randomness? So you won't even, you, you cannot make an honest comparison between what science actually says. Your, your, your dichotomy now is there's an intelligent goal no matter what. And now that there's an intelligent goal, is it better to get there through intelligence or through random processes? And I already conceded that it's more that it's probably likely that you will get there through intelligent processes, which doesn't mean that you couldn't get to your goal through random stuff. It doesn't show that that doesn't happen. But you haven't done the thing that you have to do at the outset, which is demonstrate a goal. Can you do that? Okay. Sure. I remember a couple of... Um... I don't know, a year or two ago, whatever the case you were talking to a fellow, whatever the case, and you could said, you know, it's obvious that intelligent design, you can identify it and look at it, and you can say to yourself, you know, somebody put that together, and you were referring to a bracelet that you had made, made of chain mail, and you said, you know, it's very obvious you can't, the random forces or the natural forces of this world are going to produce this bracelet, 
right? In other words, you were able to look at that, source the material, put you are it together. Confused. You had a purpose in there, and you, you are confused. Hold on, I have a question you, for you. you. Go ahead, Jenna. Uh, do you think that the it is obvious that the Grand Canyon was intelligently designed? No. Hello? No. So. No? No. What makes anything obvious that it's intelligently designed then? Well, what would make, let's deal with. When you with say it's obvious. Matt's uh, statement that his chain mail bracelet was intelligently designed. Answer the question. Good. Why? I, I, I can why answer that. Make that I, statement? I can answer that really fucking simply. A. I designed it. I have direct evidence of a design and intention for that bracelet. B, right. even, abs even absent me, we know of countless of these things. And in all of those cases, there is evidence of intentional design and action. And there is no evidence to support the notion that these things occur naturally. That is not the case for suns, planets, and life and evolution. We do have mountains of evidence of these things occurring naturally in accordance with the physical laws of the universe and zero good evidence that there was a design or a designer. This I'm using the bracelet that I made because idiot apologists will say a painting desire requires a, pa a painter, a, a building requires a building, but you don't recognize design by complexity. Matter of fact, simplicity is a better hallmark of design. You recognize that which is designed by contrasting it with that which occurs naturally. So you have two categories, things that are designed and things that occur naturally. And as far as we can tell, the my, my bracelet fits neatly into the things that are designed because all of the available evidence shows that those things are designed. And a tree shows no evidence of design. It shows all the evidence of occurring naturally. That is the distinction. Well, here's the question. Could nature produce your bracelet? I don't know. Is it, I, don't, I can't demonstrate that it's possible or impossible. When you find a naturally produced bracelet that looks identical to the one that I had, now we can talk. Why are you coming up with hypotheticals that you can't back up? Well, let's say I've got a box with uh, a, a uh, be able to hold 100 marbles. And so I pull out of this big pail of marbles. I've got 600 marbles, let's say. And I pull out 50 green. I put them on the left-hand side. Pull out 50 white, put them on the right-hand side. You know, me being an agent, I decided that's what I was going to do, and I did it. So on the other hand, I take that box now, and I put a lid on it, and I start to shake it. And as I start to shake it, you know, I look into the box and good heavens, you know, it's starting to get, you know, mixed up. I put the lid back on. I keep on shaking it again. Open the box. They're even more mixed up. And I keep on going. And, you know, let's say after five minutes, I'm thinking to myself, okay, can I look in the box? So okay. I look in the box and I find I'm you. they're just totally mixed I'm muting you because I'm completely fucking bored right now. And the fact that you waited five minutes when we're talking about things that take billions of years, your impatience and monumental ignorance about all of this is staggering. The thing that you're doing, it, first of all, even in your example, there's an agent there doing it. If you just set all the marbles in a box and left them alone, until there's some other force acting upon them, the laws of physics suggest that nothing about that's going to change until some other force acts upon it. So that would be actually set the box of marbles down, shake it up so that they're mixed up, set them down. And at some point in the next billion or two billion years, you come back and you find that they're neatly sorted. Now you might have a case for something that is miraculous or unexplained, and you can't tell whether or not it's natural or not. But until you can demonstrate this, or a bracelet that's like this, all you're doing is playing the what if game. You are convinced that there is an intentional design. You are playing the what if there's a design. Could nature do this? Yes, as far as we can tell, nature can and has 
formed stellar bodies and solar systems and planets and life. And until you can actually demonstrate that there was a plan or is a plan or that there is an intelligent designer in such a way that it is testable and identifiable, all of these musings are just a monumental waste of my time. Hello? You're back. Oh, well, all I'm saying is when we take a look at it, I'm saying that the natural world cannot produce let's say your brain did you listen to anything he said i don't think you did prove that the natural world cannot pull prove that i will give you exactly one minute to start proving that the natural world cannot produce that which science holds that the natural world is produced go second law of thermodynamics basically says that the world moves from complexity order to entropy in other words the randomness chaos what of the case what the, kind, uh, no, 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 no. What, no, no, no. What kind of system does the second law of thermodynamics apply to? The elements in this world. No. What kind of system does the second law of thermodynamics apply to? There's one and only one correct answer. And if you don't get it, then I know you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Physics. No. A closed system. Go back and read arguments that apologists shouldn't be using and maybe study some ther thermodynamics because the second law of thermodynamics applies to a closed system and so therefore is irrelevant to discussions about the evolution of life on earth goodbye sir